Welcome to Beneath the Bible, where we're helping you dig deeper and uncover the world beneath the sacred book. Today we're continuing our series about people groups of the Bible with a look at the Moabites, one of Israel's neighbors to the east across the Jordan River. Now, the Moabites are an interesting group in that their identity formation is less clear than that of other groups we've looked at in this series. The biggest question about them is how they came into existence as a geopolitical entity. They appear in the Bible throughout the period of the united and divided monarchies, but the nature of their political unity is a matter of debate. While the biblical authors generally view the Moabites negatively, the Bible does record an historic kinship between Israel and Moab, along with Israel's King David being descended from a Moabite woman named Ruth. So who were the people of Moab, and what do we know about them? Let's take a look at the Moabites in the Bible, history, and archaeology. Now, Moab shows up quite a bit in the Old Testament. And when that name shows up, it's easy to assume it's referring to a kingdom in a particular land, both of which are named Moab, kind of like how Israel and Judah are used. So it's natural to just assume Moab is analogous to another Judah or Israel, but this may not actually be the best way to understand Moab's mentions in the Bible, as we'll hopefully see. It's a bit more complicated than that. Bruce Rillage has categorized five different kinds of references in the Hebrew Bible to Moab. There are simple expressions of antagonism, extended narratives with Moabite characters, namely the Book of Ruth, prophetic predictions of destruction, the so-called oracles against the nations, geographic references like boundaries, topographic features, and settlement names, and finally there are multiple tellings of a particular story of the capture of Sihon's kingdom. Now, this story has a specific propagandistic function that we'll look at in a minute. Now, we don't have time to cover all these kinds of references in detail, but we'll walk through each one of these examples. As Rutledge puts it in the Bible, the origin of Moab lay in the punchline of an off-color joke. This is the first reference to Moab in Genesis 19, the story of Lot's incestuous relationship with his daughters. The offspring of this incest are two sons, Moab and Ben-Ami, the ancestors of the Moabites and the Ammonites. The story clearly depicts the Moabites' origins in a shameful way, but also acknowledges a close kinship connection with the Israelites. Moab, the eponymous ancestor, was the second cousin of Jacob or Israel. So the Israelites were not quite as closely related to the Moabites as they were to the Edomites, they're the descendants of Jacob's brother Esau, but they were still kin. But just because the Moabites were family didn't mean the Israelites viewed them favorably. Elsewhere, the Moabites are referred to as the people of Chemosh, with Chemosh being the national deity of Moab. However, this biblical reference is something of a purposeful misnomer meant to put down the Moabites. The vowels added to the, make the word Chemosh are the same as the word for stench. The original vowels of the deity's name would have meant it was actually pronounced something more like Kamosh or Kamas. The inference is clear that the Israelites think the Moabites stink, but that doesn't mean the Israelites viewed them entirely negatively. The kinship between Israel and Moab is again noted in stories like in the Book of Ruth. Now, In this story, an Israelite family migrates to Moab while their land is experiencing a famine. Their two sons marry two Moabite women. After a period of time, the husband and both sons die, leaving Naomi, the matriarch, and her two daughters-in-law all widowed. With the famine in Israel over, Naomi decides to go back to her homeland and leave her daughters-in-law in Moab to remarry. One daughter-in-law, Orpah, stays in Moab, but Ruth stays with Naomi, and they return to Judah. As the story unfolds, Ruth marries a wealthy man named Boaz, and the fortunes of Ruth and Naomi are restored through God's faithfulness. And not only that, but Ruth has children and grandchildren and a great-grandson, David, the king of Israel and Judah. This Moabite heritage seems to have been something that David himself remembered. When he's on the run from Saul, David sends his family to hide in Moab. In 1 Samuel 22, it says David spoke with the king of Moab, and his family stayed there for a time. Now, as a side note, a common feature of early Israelite architecture is casemate walls, a feature that we also see in Moab from an early date, often even earlier than in Israel. The kinship with the Davidic line continues with Solomon, who had Moabite wives according to the Book of Kings. Moab became a polity that opposed Israel and Judah, and so became a frequent target of condemnation by the Israel's prophets. We see this in Amos 2 and Isaiah 25, among many other places. At other times, however, Moab is described not as a polity, but as a place. The knowledge of that place is at times murky. 
The Bible makes reference to the plains of Moab. This is the area on the east side of the Jordan, also called Transjordan, just opposite of Jericho, north of the Dead Sea, and around the Wadi Hezbon. The Arnon Valley, or Arnon, is frequently referenced in the Bible in relation to Moab and is the area around the modern-day Wadi Mujib. The area north of Arnon, up to around Heshbon, is the Mishor, or Tableland. South of the Arnon, down to Wadi al Hasa, is linked with Moab in the Bible in particular. And Deuteronomy indicates God settled the Moabites in a place called Ar, the area north of Wadi Hasa. The Bible also indicates that the Israelites seemed to respect that this area as, was the territory of Moab. The Amorites and Judahites never seem to take this land. And as for the east of Moab, the Bible has no clear awareness of its eastern limit. So all this land is at times linked with Moab, but the Bible also denies that this expansive view is the rightful territory of Moab. For example, the tribes of Reuben and Gad are allotted land precisely in this territory on the east side of the Jordan. And this brings us back to the reference to the kingdom of Sihon. We find this recurring narrative in Numbers, Deuteronomy, and Judges. And in this story, the Israelites are following Moses and are camped at the Arnon, which Numbers says is the boundary of Moab and the Amorites. Numbers adds an almost parenthetical note that Sihon had taken the territory from Heshbon down to the Arnon from the Moabites. The Israelites asked for entry and passage through Sihon, the Amorite kingdom north of the Arnon, but they were denied. The story says Sihon mustered an army and fought Israel, but Israel was victorious and they took the kingdom of Sihon, the Mishor. Israel claims that this land is rightfully theirs. So we see this tension in this often repeated story about this land being rightfully Israelite, while many of the Moabite settlements referenced in the Bible are in this exact territory. The dispute over this land plays into a number of other episodes in the Bible, particularly in the accounts of the Omeride kings in the book of 2 Kings. So we can see from this brief overview that despite their historic kinship, Israel and Judah had an antagonistic relationship with Moab and the Moabites. Israel recognized the Moabites' control over the Transjordanian land east of the Dead Sea, while also claiming that the land rightfully belonged to the Israelites. Well, it's no surprise, then, that many historians and archaeologists have sought a non-biblical account of Moab and its history and culture, because the biblical account has a decidedly negative perspective. Now, nevertheless, the Bible offers the most details about the history of Moab that we have, so you can't discard it entirely in recreating the history of this land and its people. When the biblical accounts are supplemented with extra-biblical texts and archaeological data, we see a much fuller picture of Moab and the Moabites. Now, there's been a quite a bit of academic work done on the Moabites, particularly in recent years, so there's a lot of good material we can use to understand Moabite history and culture. With the increase in academic work, though, comes an increase in differing opinions about how to reconstruct who the Moabites were. Much of the academic discussion revolves around where the core area of Moab was, the nature of the Moabite polity in the Iron Age, and when Moab became a distinct polity. But before we address any of those questions, we'll look at some of the historical texts which reference Moab, and then we'll look at how we can reconstruct the history of Moab from both these texts and the Bible. Along the way, we'll explore a few notable features of Moabite culture. The first historical reference to Moab is actually from Egypt. In Ramses II's temple at Luxor, where we find a scene which shows the pharaoh conquering a walled town in the land of Moab. There's a surprising amount of academic work just on this image, but one important thing to know is that the reference to Moab is referring to a hilly land, not to a country or nation or a city. Here, Moab is more a geographical term than a political or ethnic one. It's also notable that this image is as close as Egypt gets to a stock image. It's the pharaoh in a general gesture of combat over a fairly generic walled town. It's so generic that the inscription was later scratched out and another name was put in its place. Some Egyptian sources indicate this land was occupied by Shasu, a term roughly analogous to the worm Bedouin. But other sources indicate they were, that there were some settlements. It's not surprising to see sedentary agriculturalists and semi-nomadic pastoralists coexisting in the same space. Egypt was never particularly interested in Transjordan during the New Kingdom period, so there aren't a lot of Egyptian references to that area during this time, and we can't glean a lot of information from the resources we do have because they're just so generic. Archaeologically, there is also not a lot uh, to go on for us to reconstruct Moabite life during this time. Survey results suggest that there were some settlements in Transjordan during the Middle and Late Bronze Ages, especially in Northern Transjordan, but this was a marginal place, both envir environmentally and geopolitically. It was sparsely populated, not very involved in the political and military power struggles of that period. 
We do know that in the Bronze Age, this land east of the Dead Sea was known as Moab, but it seems to have been a purely geographic term. There was no socio-political organization to speak of. Moab was a region, ill-defined and marginalized, but this changes in the Iron Age. At some point in the Iron Age, a polity developed in this region that also became known as Moab. Now, that's as mu about as much as you can say that most everyone will agree on. It's not clear when in the Iron Age this polity developed. It's not clear if it started in the Arnon and northward or south of the Arnon. It's not clear what kind of polity Moab was. Was it a state? Was it a tribal confederation? Was it a tribal state? These are the kinds of questions that the academic community is discussing, so let's look at some of these issues. Now, if there were few Bronze Age settlements in the region of Moab in the Iron Age, surveys have identified dozens, even hundreds of new sites in the Iron One, roughly 1200 to 1000 BC. There appears to be an explosion of new people in this area, or at least a marked increase in the population of sedentary people. But this interpretation may not be entirely accurate. Surveys usually identify sites by ceramic scatters. If they find a concentration of pottery in a particular area, and that pottery is dated to the Iron One, then they will say there's likely an Iron One site here. It's a reasonable methodology, but it can present some problems, particularly for such an ecologically marginal area. Another way to interpret this data is that there may have been several settlements built and abandoned on the same site within a generation or two, with each being built on top of the previous one. Now, these would appear as contemporary in a survey, but they wouldn't actually be contemporary. Now, this possibility makes estimating how many people lived in the region of Moab during the Iron Age, and thus how large a possible polity they may have been, pretty tricky to figure out. Now, even if the survey data overestimates how many new settlements developed in Moab or how large the population in Moab was, it was certainly larger during the Iron Age than during the Bronze Age. But it still isn't clear when the Moabite polity emerged in the region of Moab. There are two general theories that Philip's going to cover now. One is that the Moabite polity developed south of the Arnon in the 11th or 10th century. This is argued by several scholars. Israel Finkelstein and Noted Lipschitz have an article articulating this quite well, for example. The idea is that as the Bronze Age world fell apart, empires contracted or even disappeared entirely, and international trade dried up. For example, the copper from Cyprus was no longer traded in the Levant, and Egyptian influence over the Wadi Fainan went away. This allowed a new emergent power to assert control over the copper resources at Wadi Fainan, which are significant. The theory is not that Moab assumed control of the region, but that as the copper mines began producing in the Iron Age and commerce picked up in the region, an early polity called Moab profited from that copper trade. This early polity would likely have been based around Balu'a. At that site was found this artifact called the Balu'a stele. Now, there's a fair amount of debate about when this stele dates to. Most people who study it closely suggest a 10th or 11th century date and reject a late Bronze Age date. You sometimes see this stele dated to the late Bronze Age, but we think the Iron Age date is a lot more likely. Let's take a look at some of its details. Here you can see three figures in a typical Egyptian investiture scene. The king is in the middle, being presented by a female figure, either a goddess or a queen, to a deity on the left, who is blessing him and investing him with divine authority. The vase scepter the deity is holding is typical of Egyptian New Kingdom scenes, and the whole scene itself is highly Egyptianized. But close examination reveals a lot of West Semitic elements as well. The deity is wearing an Egyptian crown, but it has streamers and a ring around the pinnacle that is typical of either Baal or Reshef, or West Semitic deities. The female figure is wearing an Egyptian crown, the so-called Atef crown. Egyptian queens and goddesses don't wear this crown, but West Semitic goddesses do. The figure in the middle, presumably the king, is wearing not an Egyptian crown, but a kind of headscarf that is typical of the so-called Shasu of Egyptian art. On top of all that, the lunar and sun disk and crescent symbols are not popular Egyptian symbols and are more similar to Syrian iconography. The stela then is taken to be a display of an early Moabite leader mimicking Egyptian iconography to show he is king. King over what? That's not entirely clear. But it seemed that there were some Iron One fortified sites around the Wadi Mujib or Arnon area to, and to its south, though this is debated whether there are fortresses or not. Palua may then have been what passed as a capital for a small polity south of the Arnon and the Iron One. For those who see this as an early mobile polity, it was not long lived. The theory goes it was destroyed by Shishank during the 10th century Razia into Syria Palestine. And if this model is accurate, Shushank intended to divert the copper trade not north along the King's Highway, but oriented it more towards Egypt. 
Now, not everyone buys that the fortified sites and settlements around the Arnon composed a state or a polity of some sort. It may have been a tribal confederation or a loose conglomeration of allied agricultural villages rather than a centralized polity. Whatever they were, it's notable that these Moabite sites have similar features. Many have a casemate wall, which is a wall composed of two parallel walls with cross walls in between them. They often have a couple of domestic complexes larger than the others. This may point to the presence of local elites, perhaps the homes of village elders or the families of those who founded the village. And there are often storage facilities, likely to supplement feeding the community's herds or to store seeds for the inevitable bad harvest. Similar ceramic forms likewise tie these villages together as having a shared cultural tradition. But the nature of these settlements may point to an unsettled environment in Iron Age, Moab, rather than a centralized polity. Many of these settlements are on the top of the wadi. They have steep cliffs on one side and casemate fortifications on the other, and some have towers or fortress-like buildings. These all indicate that the people of Iron Age Moab were apparently concerned with hostility from the people around them. These people may have had or believed they had a shared lineage, but they built their settlement to defend themselves from one another. They didn't live in the Wadi Fulor where agriculture was easier and water was more readily available. Instead, they lived on the plateau or on the cliffside, which was much more easily defensible. All that to say, Iron Wind period in Moab suggests a shared cultural world, if not a shared political one. There doesn't appear to have been one strong leader who maintained peace across the region, as you'd expect in one state. That is, not until Mesha came along, and maybe not even then. We know Mesha from both the Bible and from his own monumental inscription called the Mesha Stella. Later this season, we're going to do a deep dive into the Mesha Stella, what it says, what it doesn't say, and how it meshes with the Bible's account of the same events. So we aren't going to get into too much of that here. If you want to read the inscriptions, there are translations available online, and you can read the Israelite and Judahite versions of the same events in 2 Kings. But for our purposes now, we'll cover the historical significance of Mesha's reign in the 9th century, when the polity of Moab becomes archaeologically apparent. The early 9th century started off rough for the Moabites. This century was the heyday for the Kingdom of Israel and its allies in Syria. During this time, Israel was able to occupy parts of Transjordan, and it seems that around 880, the Amorites of the Kingdom of Israel occupied parts of Moab, that is, parts of the Mishor north of the Arnon, and, for and they fortified certain strongholds there. They supported a group Mesha calls the Men of Gad in the land of Atarot. But the later 9th century saw the tide turn for Israel. The Omar dynasty was removed, the neo Assyrian Empire was consolidating its northern and eastern territories, it was beginning to turn south and west. The Aramean states in Syria capitalized on the Assyrians being focused elsewhere and attacked south into Israel and Judah. This allowed smaller polities, like Moab, to coalesce with the downfall of their stronger neighbors. Mesha, along with his father Kamoshiat, lived in the middle of the 9th century. It is likely due to their efforts and abilities as warriors, and perhaps their individual charisma, that they were able to emerge as regional leaders of the city of Dibon and forge together a polity known as Moab. This is not to say there were no political organizations in Moab prior to the 9th century, and we are not saying that Mesha obliterated pre-existing socio-political power structures, only that under Mesha, those power structures become unified under the authority of the Dibonite rulers. Mesha ruled at a time when Israel was weakened and the Assyrians were not yet a threat. In his stela, he describes how he centralized rule under himself. The narrative episodes follow a pattern. Mesha describes one of his military campaigns, followed by the actions he took after his victories. He campaigns north against Israel and then builds and fortifies sites north of the Wadi Mujib. He campaigns south of the Wadi Mujib and then fortifies sites there. Unfortunately, the stela is not complete, so we don't know how the account ends. Nevertheless, there is a lot to glean from this inscription. As it pertains to the history of Moab, we can note that Mesha does describe himself as King of Moab. He campaigns both north against Israel and south against who exactly? We can see in the stela itself the forging of Moab as a, as a political entity. It was not exactly an established political entity until Mesha made it one. Mesha's self-proclamation as King of Moab may be a combination of true and not yet true. He has a power base here at Dibon, but feels the need to consolidate his rule as king of Moab in the land further afield from Dibon. And it's notable, at least to me, that in the inscription there's a well-developed sense of a national deity who is likely depicted on this stela. This deity appears in the Bible by the name Chemosh, and it was disapproved of by the Yahwistic authors. This deity may be attested in personal names as a theophoric element at Ebla and Ugra in addition to Moab. It may derive from a word meaning subduer or conqueror, and this may be the reason why Chemosh is linked with Ares in the Hellenistic period. The Moabite site of Dibon was even called Ariopolis during this time. 
Chemosh also appears in some Akkadian texts from the Neo-Assyrian world, which lists Moabite rulers and have Chemosh in their names. Given how those names appear, some link the name with the spirits of the dead, and so link Chemosh with the underworld. This is noteworthy because in 2 Kings 3, Mesha sacrifices his eldest son, presumably to Chemosh, though the text isn't explicit. In a somewhat rare episode in the Bible, it seems to work. Following the sacrifice, Mesha's enemies, which are Israel and Judah, retreat. It isn't clear what happens. The text just says there is a great wrath that forces them to leave the field of battle. Whose wrath and how it is manifest is entirely unclear. Mesha's sacrifice does not seem to be connected with any ritualistic sacrifice of children to the gods, as the Bible indicates was the case with Moloch, who was likely understood as an underworld deity. Instead, this appears to be an ad hoc act of desperation that prompts Chemosh to act on behalf of his devotee. In his stella, Mesha puts Chemosh as the national deity of Moab to whom he owes his victory. The phrasing Mesha uses around Chemosh is not entirely dissimilar to the phrasing the Yahwistic authors use in the Hebrew Bible. Mesha makes the same theological assumptions about Chemosh as the Israelites and Judahites do about Yahweh. After Mesha, Moab had other successful kings. It appears that Mesha's conquests endured beyond his lifetime. Isaiah and Jeremiah describe places as Moabite that prior to Mesha were subject to Israel. Mesha took them and they seemingly stayed in Moabite control. One Moabite king, Shalman, further expanded Moab to the Jordan Valley. This is Beth Arbel in Hosea 10 and 14. And this was likely taking advantage of Judah and Israel being focused on the campaign of Tiglath Pileser III and ignoring their eastern borders. It's possible, however, that by the 730s, Moab was already a vassal of Assyria. It appears that Moab remained mostly loyal to Assyria as a vassal, and multiple Moabite kings appear in official Assyrian texts and correspondences. It's unclear if Moab participated in Yamani of Ashdod's revolt against Assyria, but it clearly sat out Hezekiah's rebellion in the late 700s. When Sennacherib entered Palestine, he records many kings of Transjordan, including Chemosh Nad Nadbi of Moab, bowing in homage to him. King Musri likewise bowed before Esarhaddon and Ashurbanipal in the 670s and 660s. Assyrian forces even assisted the Moabite king Chemosh Asa and his Moabite forces in defeating Kedarite Arab tribes who invaded between 649 and 647. The Moabites apparently rebelled against the Babylonians after initially being loyal vassals. Some of the Lachish letters mention a king of Moab, so there was a polity of Moab around 587. But Josephus claims Moab was conquered by the Babylonians around 582, likely in relation to upheavals in the Palestinian provinces. However and whenever Moab ended as an independent polity isn't entirely clear. What is clear is that during the Persian period, the land of Moab is populated by Arab tribes, including the Kedarites. Whatever sense of Moabite identity once existed in this region was eventually superseded by the entrance of other people groups into the land. Thanks for joining us for this Beneath the Bible video. If you like what you saw, we think that you'll also like our other videos on people groups of the Bible. So be sure to check out the videos that are popping up on the screen right now. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Beneath the Bible. And remember, you can support our work at ko-fi.com slash beneath the Bible. Thanks for watching, and until next time, keep digging.